Thank you for joining today's WebGL and WebGPU meetup. Joining us are Ken Russell from Google, Kelsey Gilbert from Mozilla, Alexander Popoff from Antilius, Henrik Edstrom and Ora Munoz from Autodesk, and Martin Valigursky from Play Canvas. First, a couple of housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the presentation, please ask them using the Q&A feature located on your Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. We are recording this webinar and we'll share the link to the recording along with the slides on the event's webpage. At the end of the session, please complete the short survey to help us better design future events. On today's agenda, Ken Russell and Kelsey Gilbert will give us updates on the latest from WebGL and WebGPU working groups. Following the updates, Alexander will demonstrate Vauxhall airplanes. Then Henrik and Aura will demonstrate implementing WebGPU in the Hydra Storm Renderer. And lastly, Martin will show his technique and process overview on web GPU integration in Play Campus. Now let's start the meetup with Ken Russell, chair of Kronos's group WebGL working group. Ken? Hi, everybody, and thanks, Jeff. Let me uh, present. OK. So hopefully this is working. All right, let's dive right in with uh, some WebGL and WebGPU updates. So hi, I'm Ken, and uh, here's our brief agenda. Let's dive right in. Uh, before we start, just want to point out once again that both WebGL and WebGPU are supported by Vibrant's online communities, and we encourage you to uh, get in touch with the folks who are using it, the folks who are implementing it, and help us make it better. Uh, so here are some pointers to the, uh, the online forums and mailing lists that you can uh, join. By the way, these slides are already online at the URL at the uh, bottom right here. So please feel free to uh, look at them and, and uh, follow along there. So anyway, both uh, WebGL and WebGPU are well represented here. And there's an increasing amount of cool stuff showing up on uh, Twitter, Mastodon, threads, and uh, other new online uh, forums. So anyway, let's dive right in with the WebGL stuff. So most recently, since the past meetup, uh, the browsers are continuing to maintain and enhance their WebGL implementations. There have been some smaller fixes to conformance tests and draft extensions. Uh, several smaller WebGL extensions are being proposed for inclusion that we'll cover in a second. Uh, there's progress in the pixel local storage extension. And I would say that a lot of focus has been on performance correctness and security fixes for various partners, including Adobe and Google Earth. So uh, by way of the uh, small extensions. So Alexei Kinyazov from the Kronos work, uh, WebGL Working Group finds that uh, given that WebGL 1 and 2 are based on OpenGL ES 2 and 3, they inherited a lot of limitations that don't actually exist in the underlying uh, graphics hardware. And there are several graphics pipeline features missing from WebGL that are still in the ES 3.0 scope and could be exposed in browsers, which would improve developers' quality of life. And even though we're trying to transition WebGL more toward maintenance mode, it would be good you know, for the health of the API in the long term if we actually added several smaller features. So Alexi has uh, graciously donated a bunch of time and implemented these extensions in Angle, which uh, is under, underpinning many uh, of the WebGL implementations out there. And he's also implemented it in several of the uh, so-called pass-through WebGL front-end implementations getting them up to JavaScript. So here are the, uh, the features that we're talking about here and their origins. And you can see that they date back some pretty far, some back to 2000, um, but uh, so the more recent ones around you know, 2014. So they're not even that new, uh, quite, quite old. And if these, given that these are pretty uh, widespread in terms of uh, support in hardware and operating systems, um, it's not that big a, a lift to get them into browsers. So the specifications are all here. The proposals have been checked into the uh, Kronos Group Git, uh, WebGL GitHub repository, and, uh, and you can study them there. So anyway, we, we will appreciate your feedback on these and uh, as, as they become available for draft, uh, as draft extensions in browsers, uh, please do test them and give us feedback on how well they're working for you. So uh, moving on to pixel local storage updates. Uh, as you have seen in previous meetups, Chris Dalton from Rive is developing a WebGL shader pixel local storage extension. And this provides programmable blending functionality to applications. Uh, it subsumes blend equation advanced coherent and is more general than that. The draft implementation is available now in Chrome Canary. 
So in order to try it, you just turn on WebGL draft extensions and about flags. I recommend that you do not browse the open web with this turned on, but certainly uh, do try out the pixel local storage uh, extension locally in your own applications. There's a great demo checked in to Cronus's WebGL repository that will work if you click this link and if you have it turned on as a draft extension. And that shows how to implement all of the advanced blend modes. So Chris went ahead and just used PLS to implement uh, darken and lighten and, uh, and the multiply, et cetera, all the uh, blend equation advanced uh, modes. So it's really cool uh, and a fully general way of doing this stuff. It's really fast. So please give it a try and provide your feedback. Uh, if you have bugs against the specification, please file them in the WebGL repository. And if you have bugs against the implementation in Chromium, please file them on crbug.com. Okay, so a little uh, update on the progress on the Angle Metal backend. So several developers are actively continuing work on Angle's Metal backend, which is used by WebKit's WebGL on macOS and iOS. Some of the major recent changes are that Greg Tavares' important data upload optimization was re-landed with new memory allocation heuristics. That seems to have stuck. It was really great work by Greg, uh, and we uh, really appreciate his, you know, his and everyone else's patience in, in getting this important optimization re-landed. Um, the dual GPU support on Intel and AMD MacBook Pros is complete, thanks to Jonah Ryan Davis. Jeff Lang, TL of the Angle Project, landed several large memory usage improvements. And Scott Violet and Jeff improved startup time by pre-compiling built-in shaders. The user attrition problem that we told you about the last time with the metal backend was also diagnosed and solved. And this was actually a bug in data collection, not in the metal backend. So now the metal backend is on by default in Chromium on Mac and will be shipping soon in Chrome. Very excited. And with that, I'd like to hand off to Kelsey Gilbert to talk about WebGPU. Thanks, Ken. Uh... I am Kelsey Gilbert. I am the one of the uh, working group chairs of the WebGPU group. I focus on the shading language side of it, but I'm here to talk about everything today. Um, most of you have heard about WebGPU. This is probably the last meetup that I'll have this intro slide for WebGPU because it's now just becoming, it's starting to ship uh, and you all know what it is. But uh, one last pitch, it's the now imminent modern graphics API for the web. Successor to WebGL, not a replacement. WebGL is here to stay. WebGL is super powerful. WebGL is often what you want, but WebGPU is kind of our path forward for new stuff we want to do. Lower overhead compute shaders, things like that. Development is happening on GitHub and at the W3C. Um, anyone can join and participate. Like the barrier to entry is really low. Um, we like it that way. We've gotten a lot of great feedback that way, and we're happy to continue doing that. And we're super thankful for Kronos for hosting us here to give this little like intro. Next slide. Uh, standardization updates. We'll do the dry part first. Uh, current spec is almost almost at like a 1.0. Uh, we're trying to figure out the last few things we need in order to get it actually shipped out the door. Um, there's minor updates, but even our meeting cadence, which was previously like two meetings weekly for everyone, it's slowed down, so uh, we're really finishing up um, and focusing on implementation and just doing the, the last work that we know we needed to do. On the API side, community group is doing optional features and backwards compatible stuff, but like even slowing down on that, we're really just focusing on getting this thing out the door. We know you all have been waiting for it for a while. We don't want you to wait anymore. We don't want to wait anymore either. So we're really just trying to reduce even, unfortunately, some of the nice to haves into a, we'll do them later once, we sh once we're like ready to move on to what's next. On the shading language side for Wigzel, uh, we still have editorial issues from, is from users. So it's a new language, so we kind of expect that. Um, and uh, like I said, please, if you, if you have issues with it, please let us know, we'll fix them. Um, and then the most concrete thing we're doing right now there is uh, iterating on plans for how to more ergonomically enable extensions that maybe you've already enabled in on your device. Next slide. Implementation status. Uh, I'm at Mozilla. I'll do Firefox first. Um, it's enabled in Nightly on Windows. Uh, it's actually enabled in, in uh, on Nightly on Linux as well. Uh, I forgot, sorry. Um, but uh, it's enabled. You can just run it if you're, if you're on Nightly on Windows or Linux. Um, it should, should just work. Uh, 
Mac is coming later this year um, and generally like aiming to ship release by to release by end of the year. Um, but right now there's, there's actually no way to enable it on anything but nightly. So it has to be nightly. It's our experimental branch. Like let's do the experimenting there. Um, let us know if you run into any issues with it, obviously, but uh, we have some notable to do's on that, like indirect call, indirect draws don't work, fine group uh, compatibility and deduplication doesn't work, and um, const override expressions and abstract Wigzel types, uh, like abstract ints and abstract floats uh, aren't in yet, but we're hard at work on those. On the Chromium side, um, the first version shipped uh, now like a few months ago, I guess, in the Chromium 113. Um, the initial release is for Windows, Chrome, and Mac. Uh, Linux and Android are coming soon. Coming, I guess I shouldn't say coming soon. I want to sign you up for more work, Ken. Um, coming in the future. Um, uh, Chrome is very up to date with top of tree, like WebGL and, Web, and Wigzel, or WebGPU and Wigzel specifications. Um, there's more details at the link. Uh, same thing, like if you have feedback, like, Google wants to know about it. Like, let them know. Let us all know early and often. A lot of times it's a bug. Sometimes it's not a bug. Sometimes it's uh, what we call a documentation bug, and we want to make it easier to use, but the API is what we want. And uh, as a last note, like, the implementations are mostly interoperable already. Like, I'm, I'm writing writing some code in WebGPU uh, now, and, like, there's a, a little bit of uh, fudging to get it worked, but mostly it's around, like, you can write it for Chrome, and then and, and if you run it in Firefox, you can't use abstract types yet. Things like that that are relatively easy to work around for the time being. And, you know, hopefully uh, in a month or two, you won't have to do anyways. Next slide. Uh, partnerships and collaborations. Uh, there are so many, and it's hard to mention just a few, but this is a this is a few. This is a, a slide, a little bit of an older slide, but... Um, it's still all true. And it, like, if nothing else, like the number of people who are collaborating with in a casual level as people come in through the chats and um, and uh, bug bug uh, bug trackers is like enormous. Um, but here's here's a slide full of callouts to some of the things we've been particularly excited about. Um, next slide. We have resources. Uh, we have a bunch of tutorials. Uh, 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 as much as we try to make the spec easy to read, it's not something that we expect you to read the spec and then like uh, write code without any like training on it. So we have a bunch of tutorials that we like. Here's some tutorials that we like. These are not the only ones, but they're ones that we like. Um, and then there's also a list of a bunch of samples that we have that kind of um, curated and uh, posted at the links below. Um, so check those out. Um, you can open them up. You can see what they're like and uh, let us know. Next. Contributing, please contribute. <laughs> uh, there's so many ways to engage. Um, use whatever works best for you. Just let us know early and often. Um, there's a there's a tendency to try to want to be like absolutely sure that uh, you found an issue before you come to us. Uh, but we can just tell you a lot of times, or someone else can tell you a lot of times, um, or we can just tell you, yeah, that's an issue still. We're working on it. Thanks for thanks for letting us know. Um, it also helps us with prioritization. So if you come to us and you you and many other people are also saying like, we need this one thing, that helps us a lot to choose what we're going to focus on. So please, please contribute. Please write conformance tests, the largest asks I have of you. And like make demos, make articles, make samples, like make stuff. It's the time to make stuff. We're like just getting off the ground here. And I'm really excited. Matrix chat is the main way to reach out to us, but anything, anything works. Next slide. Right, that's the end for me. I'll pass it back over to Jeff. Thank you, Kelsey. Up next, we have Alexander Popoff from TELUS. Alexander, go ahead and grab the screen. Hello. Uh, so you can should see my screen now. Looks great. Yep. Okay, so I am Alexander Popov. I live in Kyiv, Ukraine, and I work for Telios. Uh, and uh, as, as my uh, full-time job, I am a web front-end developer in, in Telios. And uh, as a hobby, me and my brother uh, create this uh, small 
the web 3D demos uh, and the corresponding Android uh, live wallpaper apps. And uh, I will showcase uh, one of them and uh, some technical aspects of uh, its optimization. Uh, so this will be uh, Voxel Airplanes WebGL demo, and uh, it is open source. So you can uh, see and find it on GitHub and uh, live demo, uh, live uh, uh, demo page as well. Mm. Uh, so how it is implemented? So it is implemented uh, using our custom low-level uh, WebGL framework instead of uh, uh, full-blown uh, engines like. Uh, uh, Babylon or play canvas uh, uh, for it to be very lightweight. So because uh, 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 the same framework is used in Android uh, level paper applications and the performance is critical for them. So basically this framework is a port of originally Java code to JavaScript and then later TypeScript. Uh, the main optimizations for web demos is the uh, to achieve the smallest uh, downloadable data size for demos because I personally I just hate when some uh, WebGL demo no matter how cool it is takes forever to load and you don't know whether something broken under the hood or it still downloads 10 megabytes of normal maps. Uh, so it uses uh, a sync and lazy loading when possible. And uh, since it is quite low level, you can optimize uh, even uh, draw order to optimize over draw. And of course, shaders are optimized as well. Uh, the main difference between an Android and uh, web demo in this particular case is uh, only that uh, Android uses uh, hardware compressed textures. So these are HTC and ETC2. And uh, this is how demo looks. So the video might be a bit choppy because of uh, zoom bandwidth and so on, but you can see the demo. So it has, it has this quite stylized look and uh, uh, unfiltered uh, textures, uh, old school voxel uh, planes and so on. Uh, scene is quite simple. It uh, has uh, four main objects. So these are airplanes, which can uh, contain uh, consist of uh, static body, moving propellers, and static glass. Uh, then uh, the scrolling ground plane uh, below planes, uh, clouds above planes, and some wind stripes for additional uh, movement effect. Uh, so even though uh, the original models are voxel ones, uh, uh, they are exported from uh, Magica voxel uh, as conventional meshes. So these are regular meshes uh, made of triangles and they have all these positions, normals and uh, texture coordinates uh, from palette texture. And uh, because of this, uh, as, uh, it can be optimized quite well because uh, uh, is it, uh, uh, the largest uh, part of uh, scene is actually the texture, uh, ground texture. So uh, after optimization, the vertices and indices for each plane model is uh, like 50 kilobytes instead of 250. And uh, this is because uh, of simplicity of models, we, we can omit data, use more compact data types, and even pack some data for this voxel. Voxels. So let's start with the original unoptimized, uh, very naive way of uh, storing vertex data for these uh, airplanes. And it uses 32 bytes because it is uh, for each uh, floating point uh, is four bytes, and there is um, it, it takes 32 bytes to store. However, in uh, WebGL2, we have half floors. So this are uh, uh, this already takes half size of uh, original data, so there's no reason not to use them. And uh, because of uh, uh, because of uh, one dimensional textures, so we can simply omit the second uh, part of UV coordinate and uh, use only uh, U. Uh, this uh, 
should add some padding to fit in uh, four bytes boundary. And uh, then it is enough to convert uh, normals and UVs to bytes uh, because uh, texture resolution is uh, less than uh, one by 256 and uh, all normals are uh, very simple. Uh, they are axis aligned. So uh, unsigned and signed bytes are more than enough to store uh, UVs and normals. Uh, so now we can fit data in 12 bytes and even two bytes of padding are not used. Uh, the same can be done even for vertices actually, because uh, uh, models uh, are not that large and they fit uh, within this minus 128 to plus 128 range uh, of uh, positions of vertex positions and uh, are always snapped to this uh, voxel grid. So even positions can be uh, fit in uh, signed bytes. This uh, gives us the result of eight bytes per each vertex, which is already quite good. So this is uh, typical dimensions of airplane model. It is rather small and uh, nicely fits in the range of uh, signed byte. And uh, because of uh, uh, this model simplicity, we can uh, uh, use an indexed uh, storage of normals. And so because uh, cubes, uh, which voxels are basically cubes, the, uh, we can have only six variations of normals per each phase. And instead of storing uh, uh, X, Y, Z coordinates uh, for normals, we, uh, for normal vectors, we can store just an index which uh, in, which specifies the uh, the phase of a voxel cube. So this uh, this also saves uh, quite a lot of data, but uh, we still have three bytes of padding because uh, vertex data must be aligned by four bytes. So. Uh, if only we can eliminate this one more byte, then we can compress it even further. And uh, we can do that by packing normal, normals and colors into single byte. So now we use not just bytes, but bits. So we, uh, we store uh, normal in three bits, which allows us to have eight uh, combinations of normals. and. Uh, uh, the rest is used for colors, uh, which allows us to have up to 32 individual colors. Uh, unpacking is quite simple in uh, GLSL. Uh, WebGL2 is required for that. Uh, so because uh, bitwise operators uh, are available only OpenGLS 3.0 and uh, upper. So it requires WebGL2, which is based on GLS3. So we have to apply some simple bitwise operations and uh, then retrieve uh, normals from an array of uh, predefined constants and uh, use this uh, color index uh, as is to access uh, to, to access palette texture. And uh, it saves quite a lot of data. Actually, uh, in, in compared to um, very naive uh, uh, full floats, they, uh, it saves uh, up to eight times, uh, not up to, but exactly eight times. And uh, even the best non-packed option uh, it, it still uses eight bytes and uh, packed is four. So it is twice more, uh, twice better than best non-packed uh, option. Uh, Additionally, it uh, simplifies fragment shader. So uh, all workload is uh, done in vertex shader. So it uh, unpacks this uh, data, uh, calculates, uh, of course, calculates uh, on-screen uh, position of a fragment, then gets this color from palette uh, and applies simple directional lighting. Uh, the only thing left for a fragment shader is to apply ready to use color, which is cal calculated fully in vertex shader. Uh, 
uh, another kind of uh, uh, improvement which uh, we have done for this scene is uh, a custom filtering of ground. So uh, we have this uh, old school unfiltered uh, uh, art direction for this scene. However, if we use a simple uh, gel nearest neighbor fil uh, filtration for textures, uh, fil filtering mode for textures, we have this aliasing. Uh, and it is particularly noticeable when camera uh, slowly rotates uh, as it is in uh, this scene. So we have applied the custom interiors the block, uh, blocky filtering for that. Uh, it is uh, implemented uh, by author permutator uh, and uh, originally I have found it on uh, shader toy and uh, applied it to this demo. So it keeps this uh, each each texel unfiltered, but it uh, removes uh, alias edges uh, between uh, adjacent texels. So it looks both uh, chunky and unfiltered and not aliased and, and quite pleasant actually. So you can see this comparison in, to the left and to the right. Additionally, we reduce uh, uh, clouds over draw. So these are transparent uh, planes, uh, which are drawn above uh, all geometry. But uh, since it has uh, quite a lot of uh, fully transparent uh, parts, uh, we have implemented this cutout uh, shape uh, where there are no uh, frag uh, fragments at all. So this, uh, this is the same. Uh, plane of uh, clouds, but with uh, blending disabled. So you can see that uh, shape is actually simplified to reduce over draw. Uh, as I said, the main goal was to achieve the smallest data size and uh, I think that it is achieved. <laughs> Initial the page load size is just 155 kilobytes and uh, uh, after all models for planes and textures for grounds are lazily loaded, uh, it still takes only shy above one megabyte so of data. So it nicely fits on a floppy disk. And that's it from me. You can find links to all corresponding sources uh, like demos and uh, author of uh, original uh, airplane models and uh, author of uh, original blocky filter and shader by these links. And uh, yeah, also my article, which has somewhat more detailed uh, descriptions of this and maybe some other stuff for this demo. So this is it for me. Thank you, Alexander. I appreciate it. Next up, we have Henrik Enstrom and Ora Munoz from Autodesk. Henrik, go ahead and grab the screen. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, so Aura and I, we are uh, um, from Autodesk and we work in the graphics platform group. So we develop a lot of the shared technology for, for graphics that is used all throughout the company in, in many different products, um, both desktop, mobile and web. And of course, we're going to focus on the web side of things here today. Um, so this talk is about USD and Material X on the web and implementing web GPU for the Hydra Storm render. And I should mention that um, what we're presenting here is the work of many team members, not just Aura and myself. So I want to start just emphasizing the importance of open standards and open source uh, for Autodesk and especially what we're doing in the area of graphics. So today we'll mostly talk about USD, Hydra, Material X, and of course, WebGPU, but we're also involved in many other graphics latest standards, just mentioning a few of them here. And we are a member of Kronos, W3C, ASWF, and the Metaverse Standards Forum. So open standards and open source really play a key role um, for what we're doing in graphics. So let's start with Material X. Uh, I won't go into depth in, into how Material X works, but it's really an expressive, flexible graph-based material system, uh, initially developed by Lucasfilm and ILM, and later open sourced. And um, 
Autodesk and many other companies have been uh, involved with Material X and actively contributing to the standards for, for quite a number of years now. And what's really key about Material X is that it describes the intent of materials and not the implementation. So materials are authoring tool agnostic and also render agnostic. And it allows us to target everything from high-end offline rendering to various um, real-time uh, rendering systems. And of course, it supports very powerful texturing systems, uh, including procedural textures. You can express various different PBR shading models in, in Material X. And it also includes an extensible shader generation framework, which allows you to generate shader code for various different languages uh, to make it easier to integrate Material X uh, into your engine. So over the years, we've been making uh, many contributions to Material X, but one area we've been focusing uh, a lot in, in recent years is the web. So we have a WebAssembly build and JavaScript findings for the Material X library itself. Um, we also added um, WebGL2 compatible shader generation, which is you know, independent of the framework you're using. So you can easily use it with 3GS or Bobadon or Play Canvas or your, your engine of choice. Uh, and we also added a Material X viewer for the web. And all of this work has been incorporated into the, the Material X library uh, since version 138.4, and it's readily available and supported in all, all browsers. Um, and since the, the uh, since we were released this, it's been uh, used by by several others. One good example is the AMD Material X library on GPU Open. So as you're browsing your materials online, if you click the 3D view, it will use the Material X runtime and, and shade generation. So if you're interested in this, uh, if you want to learn more or perhaps uh, contribute to this project. Uh, the Material X Slack channel on the ASWF Slack is, is a great place to start. And there's a lot more work to be done in, in, in this area to make Material X a better experience on the web. Um, various optimizations, optimizing the bundle size, adding support for WebGPU and Wixel. So if you're interested, you know, I strongly, strongly encourage people to, to contribute to this project. So let's move on to USD um, or OpenUSD as it is branded these days. Uh, I won't again go into depth in, into how USD works, but it's in short, it's much more than just a file format. It's really an extensible framework for collaboration and editing of very complex scenes. So it's fundamentally quite different from something like GLTF, which is more focused on delivery and um, really being the JPEG of 3D, uh, whereas USD is more focusing on, on editing and collaboration and supporting powerful features as a, the composition engine. Uh, the layering system, uh, non-destructive sparse overrides, variants, and so on. Uh, so this allows for very robust scene interchange between many different tools for many different vendors. Uh, but I'm not going to talk more about the scene description aspects of USD. There are several other uh, very interesting features that, that comes with USD. Um, in particular, Hydra, the Hydra rendering abstraction layer, and the Storm rasterizer. So Hydra is this framework to decouple the application from the renderer or the graphic stack, um, which basically provides a plug and play system where you can more easily plug and play different renderers or different implementations of renderers without affecting the application. Um, and Storm is the open source rasterizer that comes with USD. So from our desk, we're very actively pursuing both Hydra and Storm for, for several of our products and, and our workflows. And again, we've, we've made other contributions, of course, as well to USD and Hydra, but one area we've been focusing on in recent years is uh, the web. And I should mention, this is work in progress. This is not work that has been merged to the, the main uh, OpenUSD repo, but it's all available um, on, on public GitHub. So again, we added web, uh, WebAssembly support and an mscript and build target for, for USD and Hydra, uh, JavaScript bindings for USD and Hydra, uh, we have an example render delegate based on 3GS, which is what you see here on the right hand side. Um, and this release, uh, this work has been released over the last couple of years. Uh, but this has mostly been superseded now by the branch we released uh, earlier this week, uh, which, in addition to what I'm mentioning here on this slide, also adds support for the storm rest. Rise. 
and using web gpu and, and aura is going to talk more about that and just, just learning more or, or perhaps contributing uh, the usd web working group channel on aswf is a is a great place to start so with that i'll hand over to aura to talk more about storm and web gpu thank you Henrik. so so hello i'm aura and i'm i'm a software engineer at alpha and i want to talk about the recent work that has been made to bring more of the usd ecosystem to the web we have been working in bringing some of the rendering capabilities to WebGPU. We chose WebGPU because it offers many things that could not be fulfilled with WebGPU, such as the cross-platform development, development for desktop applications as well, as well as the browser. It unlocks the compute capabilities we were inaccessible before to WebGL, and it's a mother graphics API, and it has the possibility to grow together with the general graphics landscape and bring in the yeah hardware acceleration and new features and possible we also chose web gpu because we as a new project we wanted to have a more adaptable uh, to the uh, a solution that it's more adaptable to the future of the web so before going into some of the technical details on how we use web gpu i want to introduce a hydra in more details. So Henrik already mentioned a little bit the idea, but it is in general an open source framework to transport licensed graph data to renders, and it's part of the USD ecosystem. Hydra provides a decoupler architecture that brings flexibility to the scene representation and how it is rendered. I don't want to go into details, but in general terms, it provides a abstraction layer, a class that is called the scene delegate. And it's in charge of understanding the scene format. And then another abstraction layer for the rendering to the render delegate, which is responsible for bringing the scene data into transporting and transforming it into pixels, for example. And the render delegates, it's, it's optimized to access a flat hierarchy to, to make the rendering more efficient. So these abstractions give you the freedom of providing different types of renders based on the same data. So for example, you can have an application where you have the viewport and you need a real-time rasterizer. And for the end uh, rendering, you have a path tracer and they can both be based on the same data. In this case, you will have two different render delegates. In the, on the side of the use, a uh, scene delegate, uh, when using USD, usually people use USD imaging, but it's not limited to that. The application can have uh, their own uh, scene delegate, and it's not bound to be USD. So the USD ecosystem includes several implementations of the render delegate, including HD Storm, and the recently developed real-time GPU path tracer called Aurora that it's been developed by Autodesk, and it's also open source. And there are a couple more. On the so for this talk, we're gonna focus on HD Storm, which is the, the real-time rasterizer that it's optimized for dynamically changing the scenes. And it's as I said, included in the in the open source repository of USD, and it's growing with the with the community as well. So I want to go into more details on the work that we did to use HD Storm and HD Storm render pipeline. So HD Storm, as a render delegate, it already has an abstraction layer called hydrographics interface, and it makes it portable to use in other systems. So for example, there's already a mature implementation for OpenGL and Metal, and there is a work in progress implementation for AGI Vulkan. So our work focused in extending this graphics capability to execute the Hydra graphics interface commands and interpret them as WebGPU um, API calls. We introduced this new API WebGPU backend where we implemented the essential classes such as the buffer, graphics command, compute commands, and other things necessary to enable some of the essential workflows. As a particular implementation of the render delegate, HD Storm already has many shaders to represent materials and other uh, compute tasks. So to enable reusing most of the of the everything that HD Storm brings, we implemented a solution where we translated at runtime the GLSO code to Wixel. 
We use shader C to translate the DLSL into an intermediate bytecode representation called SuperV, and then we use Google Team to generate the final Wixel code. So as far as a complex system, we approached the problem in three stages. As a first step, we tested the web GPU commands through the AGI abstraction layer directly. This call actually looks similar to directly calling web GPU, but by doing this, it enables testing under a simple application that was easy to debug and it was easy to determine the gaps of the workflow that we wanted to bring to the web. So next we move to the more complex HGStorm render pipelines. We developed natively using C++, and um, I don't know if I failed to mention, but USD is a, a C++ application. So most of the ecosystem is built on, based on that. So we developed natively using C++ and then done as the implementation for the WebGPU API. With this, we could debug using um, native tools, including native graphics debuggers like the Metal Debugger, but also help us to debug faulty threaded code, which is more, more difficult on the web with the workers, for example. Finally, after having ironed out most of the problems, we did our final um, test by compiling, compiling the whole project using mscripten. We developed a simple application that would read a USD file and display it on the browser. In this case, mscripten is the one that is in charge of interpreting the WebGPU API and then calls the appropriate JavaScript commands. So, complete video. Yeah. So what you see on the screen is USD view. This is a tool that is included in the USD um, repository and it's commonly used to inspect a USD scene. So on the left, you can see the hierarchy of this model. And on the top right, you can see the viewport, which is using HD Storm as a render delegate. So the current uh, rendering has, it has it's, it's using WebGPU as the, as the backend for HD Storm. So now I want to show a small, uh, yeah, live on the browser on of this. So this is set exactly the same as seen. And as you can see, it is a pixel to pixel comparison. It's the same, it gives you the same cohesive uh, yeah, workflow as on the desktop and the Mac. So these are a couple of other models that are and um, that we managed to load. And as you can see, they have different materials, they are using textures. Um yeah. So that's kind of the, yeah, how, how it looks. And as we were testing these different uh, models, we noticed, we, we, were, we noticed some of the gaps that uh, we didn't manage to, uh, yeah, the, yeah, because of the API, we couldn't show all of the, all of the models that we, we would have wanted. Um, so this slide, it's, not for you to read completely. I just want to give kind of like a sneak peek of what it's under the hood with um, by enabling this end-to-end -end workflow where you're able to load a USD file and to show it on the screen. So USD brings a lot of functionality. So in general, we have now a USD file loader that includes the composite capabilities and possibly you can also apply the collaborations capabilities that USD brings. It also has the Hydra, Hydra rendering framework, which is highly optimized. It has the USD flexible plugin system where you can basically define and extend schemas for your USD, your, your scene representation. It has the scene delegate with the USD imaging, which is able to understand the USD data and feed it into the Hydra rendering framework. And it also includes uh, this uh, rendering HD Storm Render Delegate, which also includes a lot of functionality. So it has efficient mesh batching. It also includes a uh, highlighting for faces, points, and edges. It includes a lot of uh, material uh, shading code. It also has compute kernels, for example, to compute the normals, the smooth normals of a geometry. It has the USB preview surface, which is um, also a node. Um, saving language for materials. You also have a color correction task that it's running. 
It's also cross-platform by running on Windows, Mac, and Linux, but now also on the browser, and it has many other capabilities. So I briefly mentioned that when testing a couple of models, we run into some limitations, and we are really hopeful and happy with the results that we got. But as to be expected, with a very young API, we, 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 face, we face a couple of issues, either by missing API stages, such as geometric shader that HCStorm uses, or some missing a shading language globals and functions. And we also had a couple of issues when reaching limits on due to privacy and, and security reasons. And in particular, the max interstate attributes was a difficult problem to, to overcome. But yeah, so that's kind of, that's my presentation. So these are some of the links. And we have already created a PR for the, for the proposal for, the, to bring it to get to open USB and here are a couple of other interesting materials. Thank you, Aura. Thank you, Henrik, as well. Um, lastly, we have Martin Valigurski from Play Canvas. Martin, if you want to go ahead and grab the screen. Hello, everybody. I'm Martin Valigurski from Play Canvas, and I'll have a presentation on how we went from WebGL on the engine to add additional WebGPU support. So today's agenda, first little introduction, what we do. Then I'll talk about how we had to refactor the engine to get to where we need to go. Lots of specific on WebGPU side and then the future and some demonstration. So play canvas, it's an editor, as you can see with typical hierarchy, lots of materials, properties, you can edit your scene. We have a viewer as well, where you can inspect GLBs and do lots of changes. And additionally, there is open source engine, which is desktop, mobile, XR support and all that stuff. So that's what we do. And so far this was running on WebGL only. So now we had to move to WebGPU and obviously the engine like the old classes, for example, Texture had direct members of WebGL infrastructure. So we had to split all the classes into a base class and the implementation classes for WebGL and WebGPU. For example, as I show for the Texture. So the, the base class ended up with pointer to implementation. And another kind of bigger change we had to do was the device creation. Before we just, knew the device and it will return the device right away. Now it needs to be async. So slight API change, but otherwise no big deal. And we can run with the old examples, old code uh, on WebGPU. All right, so now one more thing we needed to refactor was to make rendering a bit more flexible and fit a lot better into modern engines or modern engine architecture plus WebGPU, where you understand your frame, which is composed of render passes. Render passes is like self-contained functionality, which, is, which describes a rendering into a render target. And along with this, it describes what happens at the beginning. Do you need to clear, clear it or keep the color? Which means, do you need to load it for memory or not on some architectures? And at the end of it, it means do you want to resolve it or discard it? So it has big implications on performance if done right. On our implementation, there's callbacks on before, execute, and after to let us easily integrate that into, into the engine flow. And the frame graph, it's a graph of all these render passes where we understand inputs and outputs as of textures and render targets and can optimize the whole scene rendering, especially at this stage bandwidth, but at some point, hopefully allocations as well. So currently we generate frame graph every frame and compile it to a list of render commands, you can say. So that was one of the bigger, bigger refactorings we had to do. And I have an example on the screenshot there, you see that we have a scene like the chessboard and we render it into three rendered targets at the same time. So MRT, 
And then later we put those on the main scene. Typically in the scene, you have lighting and other things. So as you see on the screenshot at the bottom, the black one, we have four render passes. On the first two, zero and one, we update clustered stuff, uh, cluster cookie texture, atlas, and same for all the shadows. They all go into same atlas, the part of same pass. The next pass, number two, is when we render the scene into those three rendered targets. And from debug rendering, we see we have three rendered targets. At the start, we clear all of them. At the end, we discard because we only need the resolved buffer, generate MIP maps as well. And then last render pass three is where we put those three textures into the scene and we clear at the end and store just the color. We don't need anything else at the end. So that's very simple scene. Typically this goes a lot longer. There's a lot more render passes as you can imagine. All right, so play canvas used uh, GLSL code chunks and they were glued together to generate shaders for what the user needed based on their material configuration, textures loaded and everything else. For web GPU, we needed those in WGSL and this is how we did it. So as a first step, we pre-process if devs in the shader to get rid of unused code. So then we can easily scan only what we care about. We would extract the uniforms and convert them to uniform buffers. And on the side of this, we would generate offset table as well. So then on the CPU, we can fill in the data into those uniform buffers. I'll have some more details later on this. Um, then the other bit we would handle is the inputs and outputs. Again, details soon. And after all this processing on the source level, we would translate the shader to WGL cell using GS slang and the tint wasm modules. So I have example here on the left side is source code. There's the input where we have some inputs and outputs from the vertex shader. So for these, we have to manually assign the locations as you can see them zero, one, two, three, and same for the inputs and outputs. And, but additionally, we do some format conversion. So if, if a vertex gives us integer formats of some attributes, but in the shader, we need them as a float, we would convert them right there under the same declaration. So there's input outputs and then uniforms. So again, left side, you can see source code where we have a bunch of uniforms, which are number based and then one texture as well. So we would read those from the source code and add them into uniform buffers, as well as kind of create a layout for the bind groups. So you can see we have two sets there currently. Set one is the view based, which we update once per, per render pass. And then we have mesh base, which updates a lot more often per, per mesh. So we split them into these two groups. At the end, there will be material group as well, which is more constant. And we handle textures by adding a sampler uniform as well, which is how WebGPU works. So that's how we process the shader before we transfer, transform it to WGSL. The next other part of the engine is the part where we upload constant into those GPU buffers. So we had initial implementation, very simple, just to get us going, where each uniform buffers would be a separate allocation, separate buffer. We would modify the CPU side of uh, data and upload them to the buffer using write buffer. And then we would assign the bind groups without offsets as each buffer is like separate. So this worked fine. Performance wasn't great because there's lots of API calls lots of buffer copies, and usually those happen in between draw calls. So recently we added a lot better system where we use a bump allocator out of large buffers. So we have a pool of GPU buffers. Typically there's just one of them, unless you need to submit more often during the frame, and then you need one per submit, or if you have loads of data, 
and there is pool of CPU buffers from where we allocate individual uniform buffers and write the data to. So at the same time as we write data to this for each draw call, we record command buffers for the rendering itself. And then at the end of the frame, when we're ready to render those command buffers, we need to create another, render, uh, another command buffer first, which uploads those staging buffers to GPU buffers. So typically we just do one big copy and copy a large part of the staging buffer to GPU buffer, and that's it for the uniforms. And then when we assign them using bind groups, we use dynamic offsets. So we basically tell GPU where in that buffer your uniform buffer starts for your draw call. Then another interesting part was a frame submission. So as I mentioned, under the hood, we record lots of command buffers, typically one for each render pass. But as I mentioned just before, we have one where we upload dynamic buffers. So with all these things happening, at some point we need to send the data and command buffers to GPU. So the way I our frame is structured, is that initially at the beginning, we upload all the textures. So you can see we do write textures. And in this case, we have a little character that's animated. So it's matrix update every frame on a CPU. So we up the, upload those textures. And then after that, internally in the engine, we record command buffers for all the render passes. And then when we have all of them done, we submit them. We do typically just one submit and submit all of them together. As I mentioned on the previous slide, before command buffers that use the dynamic buffers, the uniform buffers, we need to submit the upload command. So that goes first. So first we upload the uniform buffer, large buffer, then we render all the, all the render passes, which is like mesh rendering and the shadows and post-processing UI. And at the end, in case we're profiling the scene, then we create another command buffer that copies back the performance queries. So on the CPU, a few frames later, we can find out how fast the frame was. We typically uh, add a query per render pass, so we can see the timing per render pass as well. And then last bit that needs to put all of this together is render pipelines. So typically uh, rendering depends on lots of states. They come from shader, vertex format, bind group formats, vertex uh, targets, and many other states. And these can be set up in materials or any other place in the engine. So as the engine internally builds each render call, it creates or links up all these states and needs to create a render pipeline that represents all of them. So this is for us done dynamically currently. And all of these individual parts that contribute have a hashes computed. And we simply look up, uh, look up a map with those hashes to get a pipeline. And if there one isn't there yet, we'll just create it. So at the moment, this works great, but it's a little bit more costly than we're happy with. So we'll, we'll have to improve it a bit. All right, so at the moment we have WebGL and WebGPU engine running. There are some missing bits on WebGPU and our current objective is to bring it to parity. So we're working on a few remaining bits. And then one of the larger a bit is to use Web GPU inside the editor. Currently, editor is still WebGL, but when you launch your applications, those can run on Web GPU. And of course, compute shaders, as you can imagine, is a big exciting thing we'd like to do. So we have lots of engine examples. Most of them already run on Web GPU and they're live already. Have a look. And I have a short demo. So First one is in the editor. So in the editor, you can place the car, the scene, lots of area lights. And in the editor, it's all WebGL, but you can launch as you see on the WebGPU. So I'm launching on WebGPU 
and it starts the application on web gpu all the area lights works and textures and glbs and post processing and lots of other things so there's a few more seconds of this and then i'll go to engine examples we have cascaded shadow maps with lots of flexibility different number of cascades different filtering and so on and multi-view with different scenes even in each view different debug rendering per view and lots of other things uh, cluster lighting which we developed last year which fully supported including area lights on web gpu now And last example I have here is some post-processing effects. So we have those working correctly as well. Thank you for listening. That's all for me. Thank you. Next up, we have the Q&A portion of the webinar. Um, and they will be hosted by Ken. So if you have any questions, please submit them using the Q&A feature on your Zoom toolbar. Go ahead, Ken. Sounds good. Uh, first of all, thank you everyone for joining and uh, presenting today. These are just uh, outstanding uh, applications, demos, and results. So uh, yeah, thanks. thank you very much for sharing them. So diving right into the uh, live questions, let's see. Uh, Andres Hernandez says that I'm working with WebGL for mobile and it works in Safari, but there are bugs in Chrome and Firefox. Is there any way to debug WebGL on Firefox or Chrome and iOS? Since I'm not able to see errors or the JS console since Safari Mac OS only supports remote debugging on Safari iOS. So Andres, I, I did a quick search and I think that it is possible in Chrome nowadays to see the, uh, the JavaScript console on iOS, if I'm not mistaken. I think they can open a tab and go to Chrome inspect and at least see those uh, results, but I'm not 100% sure. So please uh, look online for those resources, but you're 100% right that the um, mobile debugging support only works in Safari for iOS and not the other browsers since they're using a WK web view. So um, please reach out to us on the forums. I'm pretty sure the Apple engineers also frequent these and uh, one way or another, we can try to improve the situation for you. Okay, uh, moving right along. Uh, oh, by the way, does anybody else have more feedback? Uh, maybe Kelsey? Okay. All right, so moving right along, uh, let's see. So Antonio Montez asks about uh, the weight of the cloud and data consumption in Alexander's Voxel Airplanes demo. Uh, Alexander, can you see this question? Would you like to speak to it? Could you please read that? Yeah, sure. Uh, concerned about the weight of the cloud and data consumption, can WebGPU help solve the help solve the data consumption problem? Um, one other question is uh, in the same one is: Can you translate .tilt files from the OpenBrush app to shaders from the original data of trajectory and line thickness intensity instead of heavy mesh uh, generation and GLBs to upload to virtual spaces? Um, and I guess there's a, a third question in here about Mozilla hubs, but why don't we start with those two about uh, reducing data consumption in voxel airplanes and have you looked at tilt brush at all? Uh, I'm not familiar with tilt brush at all, actually. <laughs> so yeah, of course, th theoretically it can, uh, the shader can be created, which will generate those thick lines, but I guess some preliminary uh, date, uh, preliminary data structure should be created with actual vertices which should be extruded from the center of line so i don't see how it can save some data and uh, mm, speaking of saving uh, data for uh, same vertex data uh, using web gpu uh, that actually web gpu provides uh, the same uh, ways of storing data because it is uh, hardware dependent so I, I don't see any uh, possibility to use more compact uh, data structure than four bytes. I, I, I think it's just a limit already. <laughs> okay, uh, well, maybe with compute shaders, we can run a, a Zlib pass over uh, the vertex data and you know go from 
Zealand compressed buffer to uncompressed and then yeah, feed that into the harbor. Just... Like that. Um, uh, Kelsey, uh, do you have any suggestions on how we can check the exact power consumption of Mozilla hubs and others, if any? I think when you go into checking power consumption, that very quickly becomes uh, either an operating system or uh, honestly, that devices like firmware or manufacturers tools question. Um, I think it's hard to say more about that besides just like uh, generally speaking, the faster it is, like the more efficient it is, the less power it uses. But we all know that. So I don't, I don't have any great places to direct you, unfortunately, for power usage. Okay. Uh, no worries. Uh, please uh, question or follow up with another one in the Q&A if you have uh, more. Let's see. Uh, going on, Moro Morenzi asks if uh, there is a roadmap with the final release date of WebGL one, uh, sorry, WebGP 1.0. Final release for Chrome, Firefox, Edge, but also Safari and iOS and Android too. Lots of questions. Kelsey? Yeah. Um, we wish we could give you one. And that's not a like, we wish we could tell you our secret ideas about when they might happen but like we don't have super firm uh deadlines in mind so far it's, it's going to be like a kind of it's done when it's done um for firefox's side we really are hoping to get something that uh, you could consider done um by end of year but that's a that's an estimate not a not a promise um for chrome like it's it's shipping already, right? Um, not on all platforms, but like you can just use it um, on uh, like Safari and iOS. Um, if my colleague colleagues from Apple were here, they would tell you that uh, Apple's not allowed to comment on future products or releases. Um, so that's that will remain a mystery to all of us, except for the people who work on it. Um, so unfortunately, I can't give you like a firm firm answer there. Um, only that like we're working as hard as we can on it. We're and we're like we're kind of trying to pare down other tasks we're working on so that we can get this out, out the door. So we're like really focused on it. Hopefully, hopefully late this year you'll see more things, but particularly for iOS, I really just can't tell you. Wouldn't be able to. Okay, well, uh, good enough answer. Um so going on, uh, Carl Sims asks, Kelsey, he mentioned matrix chat for WebGP feedback and questions. Can, can you give more details on that? Do you need an account membership? Thanks. Uh, I think, I believe it's like a, I think it's like a federated chat thing. It's, it's basically just like a new generation of IRC basically. So like you'll need, you'll need like an IRC like level of account, right? But it's not like, it doesn't cost any money. Um, there's public ones. Um, and they all talk to each other fine. There's no like greater or lesser privileges to them. Um, just sign up, uh, choose the server you want to like kind of call your home uh, and then uh, come come chat with us. It should all just work. Sounds good. Yeah. Looking forward to seeing there. Sorry, Jeff. I was just going to say, is that matrix.to? I think it That's is. Right. Great. I'll post that. Yeah, there are also links in the uh, the first presentation uh, slide deck directly to the room. Okay, so going on to the next question, uh, Moro asks, uh, is WebGPU supporting or using WebXR? I'm curious about the compatibility with Vision Pro and other mixed reality devices. Uh, Kelsey? Yeah, um, the goal is to do this, I think, but uh, implementation is not there yet. So there's nothing to prototype really. Um, there is work on the spec side to kind of like sketch out. We're at the like the spec sketching stage is what I describe it. So there's an explainer um, that I think our colleague Brandon Jones was working on, um, but uh, no one that I know of, uh, Chrome, Chrome and Firefox definitely haven't done any implementation work here, haven't been able to focus on it. Um, this is amongst the things that like we're like web GPU needs to happen first before we can get to it, but we are excited for it. I think that's that's the gist of it. Yep. Okay, uh, so going on, uh, Jaswant Panchumarti asks, this question is about Autodesk's presentation. Does the uh, two gigabyte max of the WASM32 heap pose a limit for the maximum polygon count for a mesh in the WebGP WASM USD viewer? 
And does the HydroStorm renderer stream data sets the GPU to overcome the WASM32 heap limit? Uh, Henrik and Aura? So I can take that one. So um, personally, I believe that, that it's one of the biggest risks of the WASM uh, because it does impose the two gigabyte limit. Um, I believe that Chrome is already working, but Mscripting doesn't have yet support. So it's something that we might be looking into. There are some like cheap games that we can do basically after loading the model, kind of like deleting the USB from the Mscripting file system to, to get more memory while running. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, it's, a, it's a risk <laughs> that we hope will be solved with Wasm64. Um, I mean, just based on uh, interactions with the WASM team uh, nearby, uh, sitting where we sit, uh, a lot of work has gone into lifting these limits in the like WebGL and WebGPU implementations to be able to upload large data sets from the WASM heap, larger than even two gigabytes. Um, and I, we think that we've gotten like all the lowest level entry points fixed uh, so that you can actually handle uh, larger heap sizes. Anyway, if this is progressing. Please do reach out to, to the community, like to the WASM community in particular, ask questions on the MScript and uh, repository and you know, point out your use cases that'll nudge us web browser developers to supporting this faster. Okay, uh, moving on to the next question, which is sort of a duplicate, but Senia Zadvornik asks, any inside scoop on WebGU plans uh, and timing for Safari desktop and mobile? Um, Again, no, Apple. no inside scoops. Sorry, uh, <laughs> only only best guesses. Uh, we're all we're all trying to get it out there as quickly as possible. They are. Okay. I will say. Uh, I guess color I can add to that though is they are uh, actively like involved in the standardization process. Like they are working with us on things. In the standardization process, they have real, real feedback to give there. So, like, something is going on, right? We're just not privy to actually what it is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, going on to the next one, uh, Carl Sims asks: Any in-person WebGP meetups planned? Looking for ways to connect with other developers. Uh, well, we can certainly help sponsor. Uh, Kronos can certainly help sponsor uh, regional. WebGPU and WebGL meetups. Uh, so if you'd like to help host one, for example, just uh, you can find your local, I don't know, maybe ACM SIGGRAPH chapter, uh, tell folks, uh, you know, advertise that way and, uh, and start one up. Um, we'd be happy to try to do smaller ones in the Silicon Valley area where uh, at least Kelsey and I live and possibly other presenters. Um, but uh, for example, at SIGGRAPH this year, our companies have clamp down on travel budget. So we're not gonna be having a, a WebGL off, I'm afraid this year. Any other feedback from others? Well, we had one, I will say we we did have an in-person event at uh, near GDC, right? We did. This year. So we they did. happen occasionally. Yep. Okay, uh, so. Next question, Maxims Michevis uh, asks, question to Martin, what do you believe compute shaders will allow improving in the Play Canvas engine? Well, that's a tricky question. I guess the main purpose of, of this for us is gonna be to expose compute shaders to the users to do what they need to do in their application. But under the hood, like I'd like to speed up the cluster lighting quite a bit and possibly post effects can run partially in parallel on compute as well. But yeah, we'll see many other things. Please suggest anything you'd like to see as well. Thanks. Okay, great. Uh, so let's see, next question. Carl Sims asks again, for WebGPU, are any more Wixel data types planned like F64, VEC8, VEC16, et cetera? Yes. I'll echo that. There'll, yes. There'll be extensions. Uh, so yeah, but you know, after we get the initial releases out the door, uh, the main ones that we have right now are like, you can look to what F16 looks like and like that's gonna be the shape of things kind of going forward. Yep. We are uh, especially eager to get 
uh, larger, da wider data types as well as, uh, as narrower ones and uh, efficient things like dot product for them uh, into the language. Okay, uh, next question. Andres Hernandez asks, I noticed WebGPU only works on Chrome OS with devices that support Vulkan. Is there any idea if WebGPU will eventually work on older or low spec devices? Kelsey, would you like to take a first crack? Yeah, um, this is a great question. Uh, we would like to. There is desire from the working group to look after we get this first release out the door to kind of look backwards at the list of devices that aren't supported and go back and see what we can do for them. Like, can we get them onto like a more limited form of WebGPU? Like, is that worth doing? Like they all have WebGL, they have WebGL, Web, WebGL2, right? Um, and those are those are fairly powerful. Um, is and But we wanna take a look at like, if there's anything to gain in that gap where like, it's kind of a device that's like, more capable than WebGL2, but not capable enough for WebGPU. So we're going to be looking at that after our initial releases. Sounds good. If I can provide a bit more color, uh, members of the Chrome team are actively looking into uh, what it would take to pare down just a little bit the WebGPU specification, just a few sharp corners of it, like being able to treat one texture object as two different types, which isn't allowed in, say, OpenGL ES. Um, but still provide some of the major benefits like compute. And this absolutely can be done on OpenGL ES 3.1. We have proof of concept prototypes working in Dawn, the native WebGPU implementation, and we have them working on certain uh, classes of older devices. So we, we do plan to bring a proposal to the WebGPU community group. Um, it, it's not very large at this point. We've emulated many of the, um, the code paths that don't work natively in OpenGL ES. Uh, and so, yeah, we do hope to have what might be considered a WebGP compatibility mode. And if you if you target your WebGP app to that slight subset, it'll work everywhere, including on more powerful devices. Um, so we're pretty excited about the possibility of making WebGP a very universal uh, graphics and compute API um, and still keeping the simplicity of the, of the new system. So uh, stay tuned and please provide your feedback on the, on the forums. Okay, uh, going on, Carl Sims, uh, hi again, Carl, asks, in WebGPU, Flow32 textures are not filterable. Will this eventually be required instead of optional? Um, probably not be required for like web, what you can call like WebGPU1 maybe. Uh, the same way that there's a lot of extensions which are super common in WebGL one that we never made technically required. It's probably gonna be that same sort of thing. Um, we'll look into it, but this is a pretty hard requirement in terms of like the devices we wanna support for WebGPU, especially initially. There's a, especially on mobile, there's a lot of devices that just don't support filtering float 32s. So like we're giving you everything we can and uh, if you want to be able to do that, um, it will have extensions, I guess. Yep. Uh, and uh, a member uh, of our team at Google just implemented the Flip32 filterability uh, extension. So at least the facility should be there in the browser to properly query that, turn it on, and, uh, and use it. And so if, if your app does that, maybe, I don't know, falls back to using Float16, if flow 32 filterability isn't there, that's the, the recommended path to making it work on these devices, on the mobile devices. You also have the tools inside the shader to write the filtering code yourself. It's like your fallback option. Kind of part of the assertion here with like, it's not filterable is that like, there's no hardware acceleration support for filtering it and the driver team decided not to polyfill it. So like you can write it yourself, you can just load the floats and you can do math on floats, that's that's guaranteed to you, but you, you would have to do it yourself, not built in. Okay, uh, going on to the next question, Maxims asks, when VRAM runs out using WebGL on different platforms, behavior is different. iOS crashes badly. Does WebGPU have a way to gracefully fail with more info of failure reasons? Uh, yeah. Um... 
there's a number of things we try to do in web gpu to fail a little bit more gracefully um we have the concept of like uh, internally null objects so basically internally invalid objects like if you create a texture and it like there's not enough ram for it um we'll give you like a texture object but like if you try to use it it won't really work properly um but your like your app will try to continue but you might get like you know black texture issues um the the fallbacks and like the other thing we try to do is we give you um we have a first class way to give you better messages that you can take into your own app and like collate that way um, the error messages in WebGL, uh, when they are decent, they're always console errors. Like there's no way to get like text errors back from these. It's just a spewed into the console. Um, WebGPU lets apps like decide what they want to do with that information. Um, as for robustness, like it, like file a bug with whoever is crashing for you because it shouldn't be doing that. It's supposed to be more robust than that. That's all I can say, I think. Okay, uh, going on to the next question. Uh, Morrow asks, I see the nice demo in Play Canvas about the reflections on the car. Is that ray tracing? And if so, is something possible using WebGPU? Uh, Martin? Ray tracing is certainly possible, but we don't have it yet. And in the demo, there's maybe 20 or so area lights. I think most of them are rectangles, but you can have spheres as well. And it uses cluster lighting, so they're not as expensive. So if you use material on the car or whatever, that has metallic properties and it's fairly shiny, then you see those sharp reflections from area lights on it. And that's what it is. Thanks. Okay, let's see. Um, I see a lot of, uh, well, unread questions on, okay. So one just came in, uh, how can we collaborate to add ray tracing support to WebGPU from Darwesh? Um, Kelsey, do you want to speak to this? Um, if you want to ask about how do you collaborate to add ray tracing support, the answer will be like participate in the spec design phase, do investigations into how to subset existing, like look at the existing APIs and figure out a design which will let us like like have an API that works on all the devices and implement on all, all of the, like all the platforms at least, not all the devices, but all the platforms. So like we would basically, a web GPU API for ray tracing would need to work on D3 12 ray tracing. It would need to work on Vulkan ray tracing. It would need to work on metal ray tracing at the minimum. Um, and so like that, that is a big piece of investigation that I think I don't think has been done yet. Um, but if instead your question is like, how can we get this into WebGPU sooner? That's a very different question. Um, the answer to that question is uh, the unglamorous things like file and potentially fix WebGPU issues in browsers and write conformance tests for WebGPU so that we can kind of move faster and get to the point when we can kind of consider things like ray tracing because for the time being like we probably are not going to be able to meaningfully even discuss things like ray tracing until next year even it's probably our, our rough timeline for that we just have a lot of a lot of implementation work to do and we can't really move that much ahead of where our implementations are meaningfully but we're excited eventually uh, let me also point out that uh, ray tracing is notoriously different to abstract over given the shape of the support in the, the current native APIs. Um, so a, a prototype was done pretty early on by Felix Meyer uh, in the uh, in the WebGP community, but making something work on top of, you know, metals, ray tracing support and D3D12s and Vulcans will be very, very challenging. So that's that's where the challenge in this task lies. It's not a simple abstraction right now. So um, since we have five minutes left, why don't we uh, plow into some of the uh, other questions? Let's see. So let me ask one of Alexander. If you wanted to support more flexible colors, it looked like in your sample shader there, you had like a, a constant array of the VEC3 colors. 
could you use a uniform buffer object to pass in the colors that you index into instead of specifying them as constants in the shader? Uh, actually, the ones uh, which are constants in shader were normals. And the uh, colors are passed as a tag, as a text, as a polytext. And in actual live demo, uh, you can switch different. There are three predefined uh, texture palettes which uh, completely change the look of uh, geometry, the colors of geometry. So only normals are predefined because they are uh, indeed predefined. Cube has only six. Very, uh, Variations of normals, but colors are uh, fetched from texture. Okay, cool. I do use this approach of uh, using a, a array, a uniform array in my another demo, but I will not show it because it is not ready yet. Okay, we're looking forward to seeing it. Okay, uh, maybe one for Martin. Um, with the dynamic uniform buffers, you mentioned that there's typically just one GPU buffer, but multiple staging buffers. Why is that? So the way CPU and GPU work together is that CPU generates all these commands for rendering. They get queued up, and at some point later, the GPU gets to them and renders them. So if you don't want to block CPU, you want to just keep writing and rendering, you need more of these buffers in flight. One you write to, and another couple are probably waiting for GPU to use. But just about when the GPU is about to render a frame, it, it'll grab the next one and copy it to its internal GPU buffer. So we just need one GPU buffer and we always copy next staging buffer to it. So staging buffer come in and wait as a train and the one front of the queue we copy to single GPU buffer. Okay, cool. Makes sense to keep it pipelined. Okay, uh, let's uh, ask maybe one more question of Aura. Uh, how well does the Hydra graphics interface match up to WebGPU's native API? Were there any particular challenges in hooking them up? Yeah, so most things work. So we basically divide them in usually three big groups, which like which are the bit commands, which is basically copy texture to texture from GPU to CPU, and also generate mid maps, which we had to polyfill by using compute shaders to generate this. Um, but we were missing a couple of things that, that can be worked around, just not, not the most efficient way. So for example, we were missing the push constants and also a lot of the code uh, assume that there's a unify memory access to the buffers. So we had to add this additional um, step. And it was a little bit difficult with the asynchronicity of the map async with respect to the other APIs. But aside from that, from the APIs, it, it, we were most, we managed to get most of what we wanted there. It's really interesting that you mentioned those actually. Um, push constants have been a constant topic of discussion in the community group for quite a long time. And, um, and the, the asynchronous nature of things like the mapping APIs has also come up multiple times. A any, you know, uh, experience that you can write up and share with the web GPU community group would be really valuable given that you know Hydra is such a large uh, yeah. established code base in the industry uh, it would be really valuable to know where were the pain points you know what worked well what didn't and where should we focus more in the future now that we have the PR open we can just point it out to the, to the particular pieces of code okay sounds great all right, uh, I think maybe Jeff, we should hand it back to you for closing. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, and the recording of these presentations will be available on the Kronos website. Um, a direct link will be in the slides. We'll post those as well. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to email public underscore webgl at chronos.org um, or visit the Chronos uh, website and find more information. Thank you all so much.